Welcome to the Arcade Artwork Restoration video. For my first project, I'm going to restore a marquee. Marquees are generally scanned on professional equipment. Sometimes these scans come out a little bit dark. We'll adjust that. We'll also show you how to adjust colors and how to fix problems. Here's our Dinobot marquee. You can see that there's some areas around it where you can see the scanner background. You can also see that it looks a little bit darker than it should be. The whites aren't very white. The first thing I'm going to do is check my settings. Image, image size. You can see the overall width, height, and resolution. This is at 400 dots per inch. That's a standard resolution for a professional scanner. I'm going to change this to 300 dots per inch. 300 dots per inch will be much easier to work with. It will take up less space and it's still an extremely high quality image. You'll notice that when I change the resolution, the height and width did not change. Click on OK. Now the resolution of my image has changed. I'm going to crop it so that I can take out this excess area around it. I'm going to use my crop tool, which is the uh, dotted line square. I'm going to highlight the area that I'm interested in keeping. Then I select Image, Crop. You can see that that cut out all the excess areas. I'm going to Control D to remove my marquee selection. Now I'm going to adjust this by rotating it. Image, Rotate Canvas, 90 degrees counterclockwise. It will be easier to work with and easier to view like this. I'm going to zoom in. When I zoom in, you can see that there are some problems with the scan. The original artwork had a big scratch in it. There are several scratches, and there's also some variation in the colors. Once the resolution is set, the image is cropped and rotated. The next step is to do a level adjustment. I'm going to zoom in again. You can see that the whites aren't really white. And if we zoom in on the blacks, sometimes you can tell that they're not truly black. This image is pretty good, but sometimes they have greens, blues, and even reds inside the black. I'm going to select Image, Adjustment, Levels. This brings up a dialog window that has several settings. You can see the color distribution in this area. Towards the black end, these are the blacks. Towards the white end, these are the whites. You can see that from almost halfway all the way up to pure white, there's nothing. That means this image is very dark. There's a shortcut to fix this, but I'm going to show you another way. You can grab this triangle and move it in. By moving it here, everything in this area of the image, or this color range of the image, is forced to be white. If I move this one in, everything in this area is forced to be black. That's really extreme, and that's not what you want. I wanted to cancel this, and then reload adjustment levels. An easier way is to simply use the eyedroppers. I'm going to select the white eyedropper, and then I'm going to select something in my image that should be white. When I do this, all the colors are automatically adjusted. Sometimes this may throw off the colors. And you can sample several different selections in the white area until it looks good. Then I'm going to select the black eyedropper. I'm going to select something that should be black. This has forced all the blacks to be true black and all the whites to be true white. One click on OK. This can also throw off some of the colors. It's good to have the original piece of artwork to compare your colors. The first thing I would do is go through and clean up all these spots. I use the clone tool by clicking on the clone stamp. If you look at the top, you can see your settings for this tool. I want a brush that has a sharp edge on it. There are brushes with feathered edges, and these are good for working with photographic images. 
but since this is a silk screened image I want a sharp edge so I'm going to select one of the sharp edged brushes now that my clone tool is already selected I'm going to select the area that I want to clone from I do this by holding the alt key and then clicking in an area with the same color now I move to the area that I want to clone over and I can click and drag my mouse which will copy the selected area over the scratch this effectively takes away my scratch I'm going to zoom in some on the image you can see where the scratch goes through the artwork here there's a very easy way to fix this using the clone tool my brush is a little bit large so I'm going to make it smaller I can select the brush option up here and adjust my brush to be larger or smaller but instead of that I'm going to use the left and right brackets which are very easy to reach so I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller now I'm going to sample right at the edge of the black line then I move up and I center again on the black line and I press my mouse button to clone you can see that I've now cloned the section from this area into this area which is hidden in the scratch. I'm going to do the same thing here by selecting an area that is good and copying that area over a bad section. I'm going to clone the orange until it's gone. Then I'll clone some purple. I can also use the brush and I change my colors by clicking on my palette color. I'm going to change it to black by moving it all the way down and to the right. I can tell this is black because my RGB values go to 000, zero, zero which is true black. I'm going to select OK. Now that I have my brush selected and a color, I can paint in that color. You'll see that there's some fuzziness around the edge. That means I've selected a brush with a feathered edge. I'm going to undo this and control Z. I'm going to change my brush. Now I can paint my scratch out very easily. And you can see that the edge is much sharper. I'll undo that. There's a little bit of white left here that I can clone out. And that's how to remove a scratch. Now that I've made some changes, I'm going to save it by selecting File, Save As. I never want to overwrite the original file. Instead, I want to save it as a new file name and I want to save my changed file as a photoshop.psd file format. Generally, I will also add a number to it so that I know the revision number. I'm going to call this one number one. Once this is saved, I will be able to go back through my revisions if I've made a mistake or if I've accidentally overwritten a color that I did not want to overwrite. I would continue in this fashion and fix all the small problems with scratches and dust. The next thing I would do is look at half toning. Half toning is small dots that are often used in silk screen artwork to simulate other colors. You can see that this man looks a little bit pink, but they did not have pink as a color in this artwork. Once we zoom in, we see he's made up of a large number of red dots. This is very common in silk screened artwork. If we look through the artwork, we'll find that his hand has been damaged. There's some scratches where the paint has been scraped away. We can fix this quite easily. We'll use the clone tool, just like we used before. We'll check that our brush size is about the same size as one of the dots. You can see the area down here that's scratched away. I'm going to go to a good area hold down my alt key and click on one of the dots I'm going to move to the bad area where a dot should be I'm going to click there and it will clone one of the dots that I selected I'm going to continue moving over and it will continue to copy 
the area that I originally selected. Sometimes you'll have to let off the mouse button in order to reset your selection. But now I have restored all of the damaged area. I can clone the black area but there's really no reason to do that when I can select my brush tool and just paint in that black line. I would continue like this and fill in all of the damaged areas. You can also see there's some dirt in his hand in this area. I'm going to zoom in on that a little more closely. You can use the same technique to replace these bad dots with the clone tool. I'm going to clone that dot on top of this one. Then I will single click in other areas to get rid of all the other bad dots or bad white space. Now when I zoom out, you can see those dirty spots are gone. You do not want to spend too much time fixing every little problem. Some of these specs will not show up on the final print, but some will. Once I have all the small problems fixed, I'm going to look at other areas. You can see that there are some dust particles on this scan. Generally, when you replace the color, these will be fixed. I'm going to show you another way to fix these dust particles that may be helpful if you have a large number of particles. Select Filter, Noise, Dust and Scratches. You will see a close-up of the area you are viewing. Threshold should generally be set to zero. Radius should normally be one to three. If you set it larger than three, it will cause damage to the artwork because it will erase small details. I'm going to move this up some so you can see what I mean. The radius is set to 1. If I move it too far up to 15, you can see it severely damages the artwork. Even at 5, we lose a great deal of detail in the end of our horn. We lose the sharp edge. If I move it back to 1, you can see the sharp edge again. If I turn preview off, you can see what it looks like without the filter. It may be hard to tell a difference right now, but there is a difference. I'm going to move this up to 2, and I see a very large difference now. We have lost some of our sharp edge in the horn, but all of the dust has also disappeared. If I turn off preview, it may still be hard for you to see in this sample, but uh, the dust has disappeared. I'm not going to use this filter right now though. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on changing these colors. If I zoom out, you can see that there may be some color variations. Some of the purple is lighter purple and some is darker purple. They should be the same. So I'm going to use my eyedropper and I'm going to pick a purple that I like. It appears in the color palette. So I'm going to click on my color palette just to show you where it is. There's the color that we have. I also have this original marquee with me and I can see that the purple doesn't quite look like that. So I'm going to adjust it to be a little bit brighter. I'm going to select OK. That looks more like the purple that's in the original marquee. Now I want to change all of this purple to that purple color. In order to do that I will use my paint bucket tool. Once I select the Paint Bucket tool, I can change the settings at the top. Fill is foreground, mode is normal, opacity is 100%, tolerance should generally be 32 to 33. If you set the tolerance too high, you can overwrite similar colors. If you set it too low, you will not write all of the color that you want to change. For instance, if you set it too high and you have a dark blue and a light blue next to each other, and you replace the light blue, it may also replace the dark blue or you may replace black and accidentally replace the dark blue as well. Keep the tolerance about 32 and it shouldn't be a problem. The other options are anti-alias and contiguous. Anti-alias means that it will expand every time you use the paint bucket tool just slightly to eliminate certain problems. I'll show you some examples in a minute. Contiguous means that it's a contiguous area or the entire image. Right now, contiguous is selected, and I have my purple as my paint bucket color. If I dump that in this orange area, it only fills in that one orange area. 
does not fill in all the orange everywhere. I'm going to undo these. Then I'm going to uncheck contiguous. If I uncheck contiguous and I click on the orange, you can see that all orange changes. You can also see that some of my yellow changed. That's because my tolerance might be a little high since the orange and the yellow are very close. I'm going to undo that. I'm only interested in actually changing the purple. My contiguous is unselected and anti-alias is selected and that's what I want. So I'm going to click on a purple area and this will change all the purple everywhere to this new color. You can also see that many of the dust specks have disappeared. There's still some larger dust specks and I can use the clone tool to get rid of those. I would also continue and fix all these other scratches before I change the colors. Now I have changed my purple and I would continue and sample my yellow. Might make that a little bit brighter yellow. And then use my paint bucket to replace all of the yellows. You can see this caused a problem because it also replaced the orange. I'm going to undo that. I'm going to lower my tolerance to 22. A redump on my yellows. See that did better, but there's still some areas that it uh, expanded into which it should not have. This might be a color I simply can't replace easily. What I will do is I will undo that change, I will put my tolerance back to 32, and I will select contiguous. And I will go through and every area that is supposed to be yellow, I will manually replace with yellow. This may take a little bit longer, but it works just as well. Those are the basic steps in repairing artwork. Once you are finished, you will need to zoom in and look fairly closely at every piece. A small spot, such as this white spot here, or this white spot here, can really stand out on a final print. So you want to make sure to clean these up. A white spot in an open area like these will also stand out greatly. You will want to make sure to take these out. Same applies to scratches. When you're zooming in, it is possible to zoom in too closely. If you zoom in extremely, you can see some jagged edges. These will not actually show up in the final print because we're looking at it so closely. The last step is to adjust the blacks and whites. We already did this with the levels, but it didn't completely change all the blacks and all the whites to be consistent. If we zoom in on some of the whites, you may see some variations. I'm not sure if you can see it on this screen, but it looks rather speckled. I'm going to zoom out, select my color palette as white and OK. All my other colors have been replaced, so only white and black remain. I double check my settings to make sure they're correct. And now I colored up white. This will replace all the white with solid white. So if there are any variations, any slight grays, it will take them out. The reason you do this last is because if you have any other white specks, this will highlight them and make them even bigger. If you fix your colors first and you go through with the clone tool and replace all the bad spots, take out all the scratches and all the dust, then dumping white will not show up. For example, you can see in the upper right corner I have a white spot here. That should have been taken out earlier with the clone tool. By dumping the whites, I've actually made this more noticeable. Normally I would have gone through this entire marquee and taken all of those spots out. Now that I've dumped my whites, I also need to do the blacks. So I go down to my black corner, which is RGB000. OK. The paint bucket tool is already selected. I click on something that's black. Sometimes blacks will have not just black, but dark blue, dark green, dark red, and other colors mixed in. By dumping black with the paint bucket, 
you make it all true solid black and it looks very good when it's finally printed. Sometimes you will have elements in an image that you want to change or remove. You can use the clone tool, just like for repairing, to change these. For example, if I want to take this logo out, I would clone the purple and then paint out my logo. You can see I have a feathered edge selected, which has kind of messed up the image because it's light on the edges. So I'm going to undo that. I'm going to select a new brush, make it a little bit larger. I want to reselect my purple. Now I'm going to paint this out again. See, there's a little bit of uh, black left at the top because my sample area runs out. So I'm going to reselect a sample area and repaint that. So now my logo is gone. Sometimes you'll want to remove elements. Sometimes characters may be too badly damaged to be repaired and they're easier to remove. Sometimes you will also want to replace text. It may be easier to replace text than to repair it. For example, you can see where this has been cut off at the bottom and it looks a little bit rough. I'm going to make sure that my color is black so that my text will be black. Click the text tool and just above this I'm going to click and retype the text. It does not match at this time but I can change my font until I find a font that matches or at least looks good. You can purchase font collections on the internet for a very small amount. You can also find thousands of fonts and some are free for download. I do not recommend putting a large number of fonts in your fonts folder on either a Mac or a Windows machine. This will cause problems with the operating system. You should only copy the fonts over that you can actually use. I'm going to just roll through some fonts until I find one that looks right. Then I adjust my bold, my size, and my alignment as needed. That's reasonably close, so I'm going to accept that by clicking on my arrow. Now I can move my new text over my old text. If it doesn't quite align properly, for example this is running a little bit long, I can double click on the text layer to edit that layer. Then I can toggle my paragraph box to open. And that has some additional options such as spacing and character spacing as well as height and width adjustments of the text. I'm going to change my character spacing to make it a little bit tighter at negative 20. That's good so I'm going to close that window. I'm going to click on my arrow so I can move my text. Now it's uh, a much better match so I'm going to again put it on top of my original text I'm going to select my background layer, which is my original layer, and my clone tool. Then I will clone the background color, which is actually taking out the original text. That's what I'm really doing. I'm just taking out my original text. If I turn my new layer back on, you can now see that we have some very clean text. This text can also be moved or customized, and it looks a lot sharper when it's printed out. In comparison to the original text over here, you can see that this is rather fuzzy around the edges, and there's some variation in the sizes. This one's a lot cleaner and crisper around the edges, and there's no variation. This will make the entire project look much better. I'm going to quickly run through another marquee just as a second example. Here's the Romstar F1 Dream marquee. You can see that it's been run on a professional scanner because it has the excess around the edges. I'm going to click on my marquee tool and select the area that I'm interested in. Image, crop. I also have to check the resolution and rotate this image. Image, rotate canvas, 90 degrees clockwise. 
image image size you can see this one's also 400 dpi because it was a professional scan I'm going to change it to 300 but you'll notice the size stays the same if I have an original I can also measure it and I actually do have an original here and I know that it is not really 9.2 inches but it is 9.5 inches once I change this my width automatically changes also so you have to watch this and make sure that your width does not change to an incorrect value you can uncheck constrained proportions to make this 24 inches I now have a full size marquee that matches my original at 300 dots per inch so I'm going to click OK now if I zoom in I can see that this is unusually dark and there are areas that should be white especially the cloud that are not white so I'm going to use my image adjust levels and I'm going to use my white eyedropper to change my white to true white and the black to change the blacks to true black and OK and this is what our modified image looks like this is actually pretty good and this is a good scan of a good original I could probably print it out as is with no other changes there may be some small spots I see a little white spot there that I could take out with my clone tool but since it's a very busy image most small spots would not even be noticed so this image is pretty much ready for printing as is if there were any problems I could go in and fix them such as right here this doesn't seem like much but it might stand out and if you want a perfect copy it's better to fix it so I'm going to select my clone tool I already have my brush set to a sharp edge brush I'm going to make it smaller so that it matches the size of one of my dots you'll also notice that the dots change they're smaller white up here and larger white down here so if I want to fix these I need to get something very similar to them so I'm going to go to the left a little bit and I'm going to sample this one with the clone tool I'm going to go back over here and I'm actually going to click on another one of exactly the same type even though this one doesn't need to be replaced because that will make it easier to align my brush so I'm going to click here and now that one's been cloned and I'm going to drag over the bad area and you can see how the bad area is now cloned out so this has been fixed there's some more small spots that could be repaired but I'm not going to do those now you know how to do those using the clone tool I am going to show you a problem using some filters for example I showed you earlier the noise dust and scratches filter now you see how it looks originally if I turn on my preview and I go from one pixel to two pixels to three pixels that's almost destroyed all of the details in the half toning so you have to be careful about using this filter when there's half toning in the image I'm going to cancel this because there's no real need for it since the image looks so good as it is I'd still go through and fix some of these little spots but this one's mostly ready for printing I will also need to redump the blacks and the whites as my very last step I can see already that I'm going to have a problem because within this F1 logo there is a very light blue in the center and white on the outside these are so close that if I dump the whites it would also wipe out the blue I'm going to do that just to show you first I select white by moving all the way to the upper left corner which is RGB 255 255 255 and select OK I then select my paint dump tool and I check my settings and I'm going to dump into the white area on the edge and you'll see that once that completed it also wiped out the light blue in the center because that light blue is just too close to the white to make a difference now I can change my tolerance if I change my tolerance there's little reason to redump the whites because I'm not making enough of a change there's also a problem with the half toning dumping whites will destroy half toning especially if it's done too often 
I'm going to undo the paint dump, and that brings back my blues. There's really no easy fix for this particular piece. What I would do is I would select my brush tool, and I would paint out all the areas that are white that I could. Some areas I may be able to do a contiguous paint dump, such as in the M around the clouds. I already have my white selected. I'm going to select my paint bucket and select contiguous. And that will only paint the continuous area within this. If I dump my paint bucket here, it changes everything within this little triangle. You can see there's a little spot right above it there. Uh, normally I would have taken that out already, but I can paint it out here also by using the brush tool. Now this is all solid white, and this has some more speckles in it. If I printed this out as it is, those would be very noticeable. And it might be very noticeable, especially in contrast with the solid white area. So I would want to go through and white out all of the contiguous areas that I could. And the areas like the F1 Dream that I could not white out because of the blues, I would paint with my paintbrush. Once that is complete, I will have my whites all cleaned up, but I will still need to redo the blacks. I'm going to zoom in here, and there are no other dark colors that are close to black, so I'm going to select black by going all the way to the bottom left and noticing RGB 000. I select my paint bucket tool, and I select something with this black and I dump my paint bucket in there. This will change all the blacks to true 000 black. If you do not change all your blacks to true 00 black, some of them may show up as gray or there may be inconsistencies in your lines in your final print. Some of your lines may be partially black and partially gray. That's why it's important to dump both the blacks and the whites as the last step. This is an example of Rifle Gallery by Chicago Coin. You can see that on a lot of these older games, there's extensive flaking. Normally, I would not even attempt to repair a game like this. If you are interested in redrawing this, which is what most of it would be, you would have to redraw facial features and most of these other features. I would suggest importing this into Adobe Illustrator and then redrawing every element. This isn't worth fixing in Photoshop. You can edit AI which are Adobe Illustrator vector files in Photoshop. I'm going to drag a Star Trek overlay into Photoshop. This is a .ai Adobe Illustrator file. Photoshop will recognize that it is an Illustrator file and it will ask me some questions. It wants to know the width, the height, and the resolution. By default, Photoshop often shows 72 dots per inch. This is much too low and it will look very blocky when printed out. I'm going to change this to 300 dots per inch. I'm also going to change the color mode to RGB. RGB gives the best results. You can convert it to CMYK later if needed, but RGB generally looks the best when it's printed. I'm going to leave the width and the height at the default values and select OK. Once the image loads, we now have a bitmap, not a vector image, that we can edit in Photoshop. You also notice that this particular image has no wooden background. If we are going to print this on an inkjet type printer, we will need a wooden background. I'm going to drag my wooden background onto the Photoshop desktop. Once my wooden background is loaded, I'll select my arrow tool move my background over. If I select the overlay, I can see that it is only one layer. So I'm going to drag that layer over the wooden image and now it's placed there. So I can move it around, center it. Now it can be printed with a wooden background or it could be printed as it was originally and placed on a finished piece of wood. If you want to remove the white areas, in case you don't want the original white or you want to change it, you can select the Magic Wand tool. Check your settings, anti-alias, contiguous, 
Since I have contiguous selected, if I click on the white area of my active layer, it will only select the white in that area. If I uncheck contiguous and I select the white area, it will select all white everywhere in the image. I can now delete this by hitting the delete key. And I can clear the selection with control D. You'll see that this has removed all the white from the image. Normally you wouldn't want to do this, but sometimes you do want to remove certain colors. Or I could have left contiguous selected and just removed the top of the white. But you can see this has removed all the color white and has left the wood background. I'm going to undo this. Take another look at our image, at our original image. Suppose we want to convert this into a vector image. We can't do that in Photoshop, but we can do it in Illustrator. In order to make a silk screen of this, we need a vector image of each color. To do that, we need to separate each color into its own layer. We only have one layer right now. I'm going to double click on layer and name this as main layer. It will be easy to identify later. I see there's a lot of red or orange, so I'm going to select my magic wand tool. Contiguous is not selected, so I can select everything. I'm going to select my orange color now. Now all orange is selected. I'm going to type control C, which will copy all of the orange to the clipboard of Photoshop. Then I'm going to type control V, which will paste what it just copied back to the image on a new layer. You will see that a new layer appeared in our layers. It's called layer 1 by default and you can see from the thumbnail image that it has a lot of red in it. If I turn off our main image by clicking on the eye next to it, you can see that we now have an image with all the red in it. Everywhere there's red in the original image, it now shows up here. I'm going to turn my red layer off and my main layer back on. I'm going to select my next color using the magic wand, which is green. I'll make sure I have my main layer selected again. And this time I will click on a green image. I can now see that all the green areas are highlighted with the marquee, so I'm going to select Control C to copy these, then Control V to paste. You'll see this has created another new layer called Layer 2. I don't want to get these confused, so I'm going to start naming them. I'm going to double click on Layer 2 and call it Green. I'm going to double click on my Layer 1 and call it Red. Now if I turn off my red layer and I turn off my main layer, you can see that only the green is left. If I zoom in, you can see the green sections. And if I turn my main image back on, you can see what's left. For the purposes of making silk screening, you may want to touch some of this up. For instance, if you know silk screening, you know that you will be adding the black last. If I turn off my main image, you'll see that some of these black areas meet the green areas. What I would probably do is take my eyedropper, sample my green, use my brush tool, and on my green layer, making sure my green layer is selected over here, I would paint in some of these areas. This way the black will paint over the green and it will not leave gaps between the green and the black. I'm going to turn my main image back on and zoom out and I would continue doing the same thing for my yellow and any other colors including white that I need to reproduce using silk screening. Once these are finished I would go through and turn off all of my layers except one at a time. For instance I would make sure my red image is selected and turned on and that all other images are turned off. Then I would select Layer, Flatten Image, and that will discard the hidden images.
Once you flatten the image, select File, Save As, save it as a name related to the color, R-E-D, red, click Save. This will save the image and you will have a different image for every color. I would select Control Z to undo the flattened image. Then I could turn my red off, my green on. I would again do a layer, flatten, and save this image to a new file name. Once I'm finished, I have a different file for every layer. I can import each of these files into Adobe Illustrator and I can use the Auto Trace tool to convert them easily into vector images. This gives me a different vector image for every color, which means I can cut out a simple template for every color and I can then make a silk screened reproduction. If Illustrator has a problem importing large files, you can reduce the resolution of these. 300 dpi is important for printing, but it's not as important for vectorization. You can reduce these to 150 dpi, which may be easier for Adobe Illustrator to handle. You may also have to separate them into pieces. This particular image has a large number of curves, and it may be hard for Illustrator to handle. You might need to cut it into sections, use auto trace on each individual section, or you may simply want to re-vectorize it by hand. For example, once you're an illustrator and you have the green image, you can simply redraw all of the vector lines by hand. This takes some time, but you only have to do it once. Here we have another play field. You can see that it's been freshly scanned. This is the original TIFF scan from a professional scanner. You can also see through the holes in the play field. In order to reproduce a play field like this, it would need to be cleaned up which means taking out all of these holes and also taking out all of the wood areas or making them solid wood by painting them with the clone tool. I would prefer to keep just the artwork separate and not keep the wood as part of the image. That means you could change the wood or you could print it without the wood later. I'm going to zoom in to show an example. You can see in this area there's holes and there's also wood. It would be very difficult to paint out everything so I'm going to use the magic wand tool. Make sure I have anti-alias and contiguous selected. I'm going to select my wood area. If I press delete now it doesn't actually delete it just goes to the background color. So I'm going to undo that. The reason is because my image has only one layer and that's called the background. I want to double click on this background layer and rename it to layer 0. Now that I have layer 0, if I hit my delete key, it actually does delete the selected section and it makes it transparent. So any other image I put behind this, especially a wood image, will show through. I want to do a control D to unhighlight those. I'm going to select my eraser then I can erase these holes that are left. I would continue doing this and remove all of the wood throughout this image. Once that is completed, I would take my wood image, select my arrow, and drag it into the playfield image. Right now it's on top of the image, so you really can't see the playfield. So I'm going to rearrange it by dragging this layer to the bottom. Now if I zoom in to the area I was just working on, you can see that it's a wooden area and it does not show the hole any longer. If I turn off my wood grain background, you can see it's completely transparent as it was a while ago. I turn my wood grain background back on, and you can see it looks like solid wood. When this is printed out on an inkjet printer, it will look like wood. There are some problems when reproducing using an inkjet printer. For example, plastic colored inserts like this clear insert or white insert or this slightly red insert, these will show up exactly as they appear here. You may want to redraw these and make them a solid color or if you have an original play field you may want to cut them out. If you do that you will have an edge that can affect the ball's play. It's generally better to leave these in place 
and either leave them exactly like they are or redraw them. For example, you might make this one a solid white and this one a solid red. Then you can use any play field underneath it or any piece of wood underneath it. Simply cut a hole with a light in it or you may omit the lights altogether. The rest of the playfield restoration is the same as for marquees. You zoom in, you repair damage, you replace colors. Be careful of damaging half toning like this. Once you are finished, you will have a final piece that is ready to print. If you would like to make a silk screen version, there is a discussion under another playfield that explains how to extract individual colors and turn them into vector images very easily. Here's a Jurassic Park translate for a pinball machine. You'll see that it's reversed. Some printing systems require a reverse print. I'm going to flip this one because we do not need it reversed. Flip canvas vertical or flip canvas horizontal are the options. I want to flip this one from right to left, so I will select horizontal. You'll notice that this image is different from others. This is more of a photographic type of image. This is not silk screened. You cannot use the same techniques of color dumping to replace colors on this image. This image has already been touched up, so it doesn't need very much work. Most photographic images do not require as much touch up as silk screened images. Silk screened images show imperfections a lot more than photographic type images. If we did need to fix something on this, or if we wanted to make a change, for example, if we wanted to take this dinosaur out, we could use the clone tool. Select an appropriate area. And clone him out. You'll notice there's a sharp edge here. That's because I have a brush selected with a sharp edge. This was left over from my work with silk screened artwork. When you're working with photographic artwork, you generally want a softer edge, a feathered edge. I'm going to click on this feathered edge brush and try this again. Especially when getting close to another subject, it comes out a lot smoother. Now our dinosaur is gone and we really can't tell the difference. If I want to clean it up even further, I can reclone the area that I already cloned. No one would really be able to tell if there was a dinosaur there. If this was an imperfection or a hole, it could easily be taken out. I'm going to show you what would happen if I tried to correct some of these reds using the paint dump method. If I sample this red and I use my paint dump tool and I redump this red. I'm going to show you what this will do in only a small selection so that you can compare to the original. I'm going to select my paint dump tool and redump this red. And you'll see it made everyone's face extremely red. It doesn't look correct. I'm going to undo that. When you're dealing with photographic works, you generally don't do paint dumps like that. 